you have a Bible to turn to the Old Testament to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we'll be reading the first 18 verses. Uh, we're leaving our series in Luke. We're moving to a new series in 1 Samuel. Uh, we've covered a lot of important ground in Luke. We talked about uh, trusting the character of Jesus, that he's good, that he actually wants to and does break down the walls of hostility, that he wants to be our friend, that he's with us in whatever season of life that we're in. And then we finished our series in Luke by thinking about how to drill the wells of our hearts deeply into Jesus through prayer, and then finally on Easter, through worship together uh, as a church on Sunday. Uh, in other words, our theme in our series on Luke turned out to be, because I did not plan it this way, uh, growing closer to Jesus together. Uh, and as I was reflecting on that, I was drawn to 1 Samuel because I've come to see that in 1 Samuel, one of the main themes is maturing in the Lord together. And so I think this is a natural follow-on to our series in Luke because when we spend time with Jesus, Jesus gives us opportunities to learn and grow more and more into his image. And now, historically, 1 Samuel follows immediately from the book of Judges. And without getting too deep into it, in Judges, Israel has reaped the harvest of failed discipleship. Uh, Jesus gave her all sorts of opportunities to learn how to handle pain and happiness, poverty and riches, uh, alienation and belonging in a spiritually mature way, but she refused to learn. She didn't learn how to handle suffering or how to handle temptation or the presence of idols in the world. She didn't learn how to handle conflict and reconciliation in a way that, that looks like Jesus. And the consequence of that was not only Israel's spiritual decline, which was characterized by idolatry, anger, violence, and division, which sounds maybe a little too familiar to us these days, uh, but she also could not be uh, the living prophetic sign that God had called his people to be in, in the world. I mean, after all, God's goal for us as his people is to be lights shining on a hill. We're, we're called to be a community that the world looks at in wonder because we are so kind and, and so loving and so merciful. We're so hospitable and, and welcoming and peaceful and just and holy and honest and dependable and forgiving and, and generous. And then they are to see that we are that way because we are so unwaveringly faithful to God. Uh, we're so committed to his word and so devoted to walking with Jesus day by day, such as the, the word of Christ and, and the presence of Christ have transformed us into this life-giving representation of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's what God wants for us as his people. Uh, in 1 Samuel, Jesus begins renewing his work of maturing his people so that they can learn the ways of the Lord and learn to live out the culture of heaven on earth. And so be that prophetic sign to the world and bless those also not just outside of the world, but within the church with the, with the experience of all the blessings of holiness that God has for us and that he has given us and wants to give us through Jesus. And so given that larger context then, I hope we're not surprised this morning to see that the first thing Jesus draws our attention to you is how to mature and grow in the way that we respond to unfulfilled longings and broken hearts. Uh, my friends, uh, in order to walk well with Jesus in a fallen world with fallen people in a church that is itself uh, less than perfect, uh, we need to learn how to respond to broken hearts and unfulfilled longings in ourselves and in those around us the way that Jesus would have us to do. Uh, and so to put it as clearly as I can, in order to shine the light of heaven well in a fallen world, we need to learn how to respond to uh, sin, suffering, and pain, and longing in a way that opens our hearts to God. 
so that through Jesus, our hearts can be widened and thus opened more in mercy towards each other. That's the goal of the sermon, to learn how to open our hearts to God in the middle of uh, suffering and pain and broken hearts and unfulfilled longing and the experience of sin so that through Jesus, our hearts can be widened in mercy towards others and be capacious and open the way that Jesus' heart is capacious, has capacity to bring us in and is wide to us as, as he draws us near when we suffer. And so as we read 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 18, you're going to see three people who each have their own suffering and their own unfulfilled longings. You're going to see different responses, which we're going to look at. And then at the end, you'll see Eli, the priest, demonstrate, I think, uh, what a heart widened by Jesus looks like. And so uh, let's, let's read our passage, 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 18, and then we'll reflect on all this together. There was a certain man of Remathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina and his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, even though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you not weep? Why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord. I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. But I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Thus far the reading of God's own word. Uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, which you have given to us to instruct us and to teach us and to show us how to live for you and follow you and uh, the way in which it exposes um, unhealthy, sinful responses and calls us to righteous responses. Uh, Lord, we want your word to transform us this morning more into the image of Christ and to teach us how to live more for him so that we can shine uh, like lights on a hill so that we can be uh, clearer and clearer lights of the gospel. But Lord, we know that unless your spirit blesses your word to us, uh, it will not have any effect on us at all. And so Lord, we pray 
that your spirit would give us ears to hear and minds to understand, and hearts to believe your word. Father, may the words of my mouth as your preacher and may the meditation of all our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word. May it all now be pleasing in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The question at the heart of Elkanah's, Penina's, and Hannah's struggles is, what do you do with a broken heart and with unfulfilled longings? So at the beginning of the chapter, we have Elkanah and his two wives, and the text tells us very clearly in verse 5 that Elkanah loved Hannah more than he loved Penina. Uh, So when we see Penina taunting Hannah, insulting her, belittling her, provoking her, irritating her grievously to the point of tears and to obvious depression, like we saw so clearly in our text, uh, the reason for that isn't that Penina is just an evil person who likes to hurt people. Penina is not a a sociopath. Uh, She is herself hurt. The man that she loves, loves someone else more than he loves her. He treats her with less affection, less care. She gets less gifts. She gets prayed for less. That's verse 4, right? That's all summarized in verse 4. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina and his wife and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he gave her a double portion. And notice, the text seems to imply that he did this in front of his and Penina's children. Here's yours, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours, honey. So not only is Penina personally hurt, she's also shamed in front of her children. And they're probably hurt. And that also probably hurts Penina. And so as Penina is being sinned against, hurt, overlooked, what is her response? I mean, what do you do with a, with a broken heart? What do you do when all of your longings of your heart are, are unfulfilled, when you're not loved well by the person uh, who married you, when your, your kids are shown that they don't need to treat you with respect, or when your heart is broken because your kids are hurting is something that all parents understand. Well, Penina's response is to follow the script that Israel had been teaching each other to follow and passing down to each other for years throughout the book of Judges, uh, which is when you get hurt, you pass that hurt on to someone else. Uh, You get sinned against, harden your heart so you can protect yourself from further pain, distance yourself uh, from the person who in your mind is responsible for your pain so that you can hurt them back. Uh, The end of Judges, the book of Judges, is very brutal. Uh, I would suggest if you have young children, if you wanted to go home and read it, that you preview at least the last three chapters before you read them to any young kids. So you can either skip some verses or summarize them in an age-appropriate way. But if you read the last three chapters of Judges, you you will see this. Israel's response to hurt and sin and unfulfilled longing is uh, to close themselves off to their neighbor, to harden their hearts, and then uh, to use violence, insults, and threats to get what they want. And so Penina is simply responding the way that I think she's been taught to respond by the church, by the people of God. This is probably the way that her parents treated her, or maybe her friends and neighbors treated her. And I say all this to, so I can tell, remind us that uh, we all have scripts. We all have uh, guidelines, rules, or whatever you want to call them that we have received from our family, our friends, our culture that tell us how we should respond when we have broken hearts, uh, when we're sad, when we're lonely, when we're offended. And Penina's script simply it wasn't a good one. It was a sinful one. And then notice this too. Uh, I think this is important for us to see. I've I've already kind of said it, but I want to highlight it again. She learned this from people like her who believed and worshipped in Jesus. We have this view of sort of Old Testament Israel that like they were completely not like us. They didn't really love Jesus. They all needed to be converted because they're wicked pagans. Like, no, my friends, like 
When you come to Jesus, that does not mean that everything is automatically fixed and everything you do is just so perfect and you don't have to unlearn uh, sinful responses and scripts and, and ways of reacting to the world. Uh, Panina is a part of God's people, and like us, there were unhealthy rhythms of response, patterns of response, instruction manuals that were passed on from parents to children and grandparents to their kids and that said, hey, when someone hurts you, hurt them back first. Punish them. Right? I'll give you something to hurt about. Right? So rather than sit in judgment of Penina or dismiss Penina as just the worst, I'm nothing like her, I think it's better for us to recognize that she's living out the training that she received. She is being a good disciple of the lessons she was taught. Because when we do that, not only then do we develop compassion for our fellow sinners and learn to view them as people who, like us, were taught poorly by the world and by the flesh and sin and the devil and all that, how to respond, but then we also open up our own hearts to interrogation by the Holy Spirit, where we can ask ourselves, wait, am I like Penina? When I'm, when I'm hurt, when I'm sinned against, when I'm brokenhearted, when I have unfulfilled longings, do I take my pain out on others? Do I start picking at people with my words and cutting them down and cutting them off and breaking them? Do I harden my heart toward my neighbor so that I can do that, so I don't feel compassion for the way I've just hurt them? because I myself am hurt? What script am I following? Is Penina like me? Is this someone like me? But now Penina is not the only one living out a spiritually unhealthy and destructive script in this passage. Elkanah very much is too. So as we read, Elkanah loves Hannah deeply, and uh, what he apparently wants more than anything is for her to be happy, and that's what we want for people we love, right? We want them to be happy, we want them to be joyful, but Hannah is not. And Elkanah appears to be so frustrated that there's nothing he can do, at least as far as he can tell, to make her truly happy because he can't fulfill the, the longings of her heart. And because there isn't any record of Elkanah trying to mediate between Penina and Hannah, I think you can also see here, if you're sort of reading maybe between the lines a little bit or paying attention, I think he's afraid of conflict. I think he's scared of Hannah's pain. I think he's wary of Penina's anger and maybe, and actually having been a pastor for a little bit, I would say most definitely, uh, he's uneasy with himself because he knows that if he does try to address their struggles, that he will have to repent for his own behavior which is very much at the root of all of this. In other words, I think Elkanah is showing us what it looks like to avoid facing tough situations, tough emotions uh, within other people and within your own heart. I think that's what Elkanah is doing in verse 8 when he's at dinner with his family and he looks at Hannah and he says, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Now, when you read commentators on this, they'll say, well, that's very insensitive. Beloved, this is not just insensitive words. Elkanah knows the issues. He knows she's sad because her longing to have children isn't fulfilled, right? He says that. He also knows that Penina is angry with him and that Penina is taking that anger out on her. But he doesn't want to deal with it. He doesn't deal with it. And so Elkanah follows another script, which is very much not Jesus' script. Right? Jesus says, if you know your brother has something against you, leave your gift to the altar, go be reconciled to your brother, right? Like go solve the problems that exist among yourselves. Like that's not what Elkanah does. The script he follows is avoidance. And when avoiding it doesn't work, right? We, we all know this. If you close your eyes and you put your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 you hope the problem will just solve itself and go away, right? If I just let it alone for a few months, they'll figure it out. I won't have to do anything. When the problem didn't go away, 
when ignoring the problem didn't solve it, he uses a guilt trip to try to stop it. Can't you just stop wanting to be a mom and being so upset by Penina's mistreatment? And, and can't you stop being so frustrated that I'm not taking responsibility for my role in all this? Like, don't you love me? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Why are you inflicting such pain on me? See, that's not the way that Jesus teaches us to speak to each other when we're heartbroken. But I think we can probably recognize this way of speaking to each other in our own lives. right? We, we have all experienced or used manipulation to try to stop difficult emotions, difficult situations from reaching our hearts. Right? We've tried to use this to stop us from having to face them in our own hearts. Why do you want me to face this? How come you don't care about me? Can't you see I'm tired and you're always sad anyway? And this is all your fault. Avoidance and manipulation. That's Elkanah's script. And then let me add this too. I think, again, like Penina, I don't think Elkanah is just a terrible person. Uh, I don't think he's evil. Like he's a worshiper of Jesus, right? He's part of the church. He's regular at worship. He takes his family to church uh, every Sunday, as we say, or he takes them to temple whenever they're called to go. He's giving offerings to the, to the Lord. He's trying to live with Jesus. I think Elkanah's problem is he just hasn't learned yet how to face his own failures or how to face his wife's suffering or his other wife's anger. And I think he's just exhausted by the whole thing. To connect this back to the beginning, I don't think Elkanah has learned how to give his heart, uh, his fear, his heartache, his pain to Jesus, which is why he cannot figure out how to help Penina and Hannah give their heartache to Jesus. Because you can't help others do what you haven't yourself learned to do. You you can't give to others the capacious, enduring mercy and patience that you yourself have not received from God. And that's true of Penina too. She hasn't learned how to take her justifiable anger, her understandable heartache, her real suffering, her real shame to Jesus so that he can take her heart and fill it with his mercy and grace and patience and then return it to her wider, stronger, a holier, more able to turn the other cheek and not take her anger out on others. And I hope seeing these, these two here uh, encourages you, beloved, because we all come to the Lord having learned different scripts. Some of us have learned uh, from generations of, of bad teaching how to respond by taking our pain out on other people, by doing avoidance. And I think it's good for us to see that in the church of Jesus, there are people who have that same experience and that God doesn't simply say, well, looks like you're going to hell for not being perfect. Bye. No, Jesus here in this passage begins this process of discipling and maturing and growing his people out, replacing these sinful, harmful, death-dealing scripts with something better with the life of Christ. I say that though, there's one more script we need to look at here. Well, really two more, but one more that we're gonna look at more in depth, which is Hannah's. Well, actually, let me, let me say this. Before we move to Hannah, I have another point I need to make. It's the second point. It's short, but it's important. And I'm gonna to return to this over and over again in our series. Uh, all of this is related to a huge issue in the Bible, which is what purpose does God have for us when he gives us seasons of heartbreak and unfulfilled longings? Like, why does God let us experience these difficult things? And I want to bring up this question because understanding the answer to that question is going to help us understand how you walk with God in heartbreak and in longing and in suffering and how to begin replacing the scripts that we have received that are maybe destructive and unhealthy with the one that Jesus wants to give us. Now, I know this is a huge question, right? Like, the problem of pain is a big deal. Like, why does God allow suffering? And why does he let pain happen into our lives? Why unfulfilled longings? Why broken hearts? Uh, this is going to be a, a short section in the sermon, uh, just brief, but we're going to return to it kind of over and over throughout our series. 
Here's my answer. Uh, when we experience uh, the effects of sin, like suffering, heartbreak, unfulfilled longing, there are really two possible outcomes. And, and, I, and I really think there are only two. One response to them is we can close off our hearts in some way so that we don't have to take any in any more pain and suffering. And that's what Penina and Elkanah were doing. They were saying the hurt is too much, the pain is too great, the problems are too big, the solutions are impossible, so I'm going to just close down my heart. Uh, Penina uses anger and intimidation to close down her heart. Elkanah, Elkanah uses avoidance, and I think guilt trips, or we might say manipulation to do this, but either way, they are closing themselves off to the hurt of other people, Hannah in this case, and I think also to the hurt within themselves. That's one response to pain and suffering. Armor your heart with anger, armor it with avoidance, close off, shrink down, step away. There are other ways that we can do this too. Uh, we can do this by self-medicating with uh, alcohol or drugs. We can use entertainment to distract us from hurt and heartache. Uh, we can adopt a who cares attitude that sort of shrugs its shoulders when we see people in pain. We're like, yeah, it's the world's life. What are you going to do about it? Uh, we can, this is, this is a very common one, we can try changing jobs, uh, changing locations in relationships, right? If I just move and, and replace all the people who are difficult with new people, then maybe these new circumstances, maybe that will protect me. Uh, a friend of mine calls it sanctification by a change in circumstances. Uh, there's so many ways that we can, we can do this. But none of these things produces the change that Jesus is after in our lives, which is wider, more capacious hearts. Hearts that are, have a capacity to take in people in their suffering, in their heartache, in their brokenness, without judgment, but in hospitality and welcome and in love and in kindness and care for them without being overwhelmed by them. And in the Bible, when God brings his people through suffering and hardship, there is one major goal that appears over and over and over again, which is to grow our hearts wide enough to love people in their brokenness and in their suffering. It's a way of sort of killing the inner Pharisee, which wants to say, this is your fault, feel bad about it, and bringing out the presence, the, the, the image of Christ who in our brokenness descended to us and stepped near us and opened his heart and said, I love you, I am here, I am taking you in. I think one easy person to see this uh, in in the Bible, uh, other than Jesus, is David, uh, who also happens to appear in 1 Samuel. Uh, David went through immense, immense times of heartbreak, suffering, unfulfilled desire, uh, experiencing the effects of sin, affliction, tiredness, hunger, why did Jesus bring David through all of this? Well, I think if you were to read the Psalms, you would see why. Because through his affliction and suffering, David learned and then wanted to explicitly teach God's people about how big and wide and deep God's heart is to those who are suffering and broken. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 34, we're David says, I want to teach God's people some things about the Lord. He says, listen to me and I will teach you the ways of the Lord. In verse 18 of Psalm 34, he said, one of the things he wants to teach us, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Beloved, when we walk with God in pain and suffering well, when we do it as disciples of Jesus who are trying to follow his script, who are trying our best to respond faithfully, our, our hearts will not harden. They will soften. They will not shrink. They will expand. They won't be repulsed by difficult emotions. They won't run from them the way that Alcana did. And they won't armor themselves with anger or venom the way that Penina did. I know when we walk with God well, our hearts will armor themselves with the mercy of God. They will face 
with difficult things, with trust in God's character. And they will welcome others into that same mercy and trust because the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. And, uh, and then they, we don't then turn others out when they're struggling to learn the lessons that Jesus would teach us. They don't turn away from people and their imperfections. They turn towards them like Jesus does for us. And then all of that brings us to Eli. Uh, Eli meets Hannah after her very difficult dinner. Uh, she left the table. She went to the, ta- to the tabernacle. She's weeping bitterly, verse 10, and she's pouring out her heart to God. Uh, now, you would have probably expect me to say at this point that we should follow Hannah's lead and take our hurts and heartache to God in prayer. And yes, we should do that. That is definitely something the text is calling us to do. But I want you to notice something very important about Hannah. Notice that she made a vow to God that uh, if he gave her a son, she would give him to the Lord. And it's verse 11. We'll talk about that more next week, Lord willing. But then notice that after that, Eli encourages her. And then in verse 18, we're told she isn't sad anymore. Now, I want you to be to notice this, there's no baby. There's nothing that's happened that could cause a baby. Uh, Eli didn't promise that she'd get a baby. Uh, His words don't amount to a promise from the Lord that she would get pregnant despite what some commentators say. That's a very frustrating thing for me to see in those, those books. Eli's response, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your request, was just the, the normal way that priests of Israel would greet people on their way out from prayer. It's a, it's a much holier, better way. Uh, like when I'm saying, saying bye to you guys, I'm like, have a good week. You know, this is much more spiritually encouraging, right? Like the Lord grant your prayers. Good to see you. That's what the priest would do on their, on their way out. It was not an uncommon thing for Eli to say or for Hannah to hear. So then why this time does Hannah leave happy? Here's why I think. I think Hannah was praying to God, but was afraid that God wasn't really listening, that he didn't really care. I think Hannah's response to heartbreak and and suffering wasn't anger, it wasn't avoidance, it was prayer. But it was prayer that lacked the assurance that Jesus actually cared about her, that he actually saw her, that he actually loved her, that he actually walked with her. I think Hannah's struggle was similar to maybe some of your struggles, which is she's someone who grew up in the church. She learned the correct script, that the first step to responding to heartbreak and unfulfilled longing was to pray. And so she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. But deep down, like some of you who were raised in the church nine months before you were born, didn't really think that Jesus was really listening. I mean, yeah, he probably listens to other people, but not me. Like Jesus doesn't really care about me. And I think that's why she couldn't find rest for her heart despite her continual prayers. She was praying to a God that she didn't really trust, heard her, or didn't really trust, cared about her. And then Eli steps in. Uh, Eli has a rough history of interpretation in 1 Samuel because we'll see God brings judgment on Eli's house. And then whenever we see judgment, we think, well, Eli must be going to hell. I don't think it's quite that simplistic at all. Uh, when I read his story in 1 Samuel, I see that Eli is a high priest in the time of the judges. I think we can see that he is respected as a priest, but his life and his ministry do not have the transforming effect that he wanted it to have on God's people. Eli was a godly man who simply could not inspire godliness in others very well. And I'll tell you, like, as a pastor, uh, or as elders, I'm sure can tell you, like, there's a real feeling of failure that can accompany that reality. When you are trying to lead people down paths of righteousness, and it just, they keep going off into the, the muck and the mire, and there's nothing you can do about it. Like, there's a real sense of, of failure. And I think you can see Eli in the book of First Samuel reckoning with the fact that his flock is broken, And he cannot help them. That is not the mission God has given for Eli, despite the work he's put into it. 
And then when Hannah is sitting there in front of him, Eli at this point is pretty old and he's not in great shape, meaning he has physical suffering. And his sons, as we'll see in the next little bit, are terrible people who really do not love Jesus. They do not respect Eli. They uh, abuse the church, the people in the church. They're not good fathers. They're mistreating his grandchildren. And we know on top of that, that at this point, Eli is also a widower. So Eli, too, has heartbreak. He has unfulfilled longings. He has shame. He has guilt. He has hurt. He's, he's sinned and he's been sinned against, but he doesn't close off his heart. He doesn't avoid the pain of others. You know, he sees Hannah praying like a crazy person, as a friend of mine described it, and he goes to her and he says in verse 14, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Now, I'm reading that in a gentle tone because I think if we read this in a harsh tone, we are very much misreading it. Given that she's weeping bitterly and has had years of unfulfilled longing, years of heartbreak, I think if Eli had spoken to her in anger, how come you're so drunk? Stop being drunk. I think she just would have got up and walked off. After all, when you are overwhelmed and someone you don't know, even if it's a pastor, comes up to you and tells you off for something you didn't do, do you then open up your life the way that Hannah did? Like, oh no, let me tell you all about struggles in my heart. No, you either yell at them or you walk away from them, right? She doesn't do that. And that tells me that we should read Eli's tone the way that we would read Jesus' tone. A gentle, with the implication that he is there and he's willing to help her uh, there are ways of giving a rebuke that tells somebody, hey, I, I'm here to help you through this, right? It's not just stop it, but I love you. Let me help you. And that's why I think uh, she then takes the time to say like, no, no, Eli, you've got it wrong. I'm not drunk. I'm just so overwhelmed and I'm praying to God and I'm desperately hoping that he hears me. When she talks about vexation, that word there uh, describes people who are praying to God who don't think that God is listening. It's this idea of being derelict, left alone, left absent from God. I'm praying to the God that I think has abandoned me. Now notice that she doesn't tell him what her struggle is exactly. She doesn't tell him about her vow, and Eli doesn't ask. He doesn't say, well, that's interesting. Explain your problem to me in detail so that I can tell you where your theology is off, or so that I can, like, you know, give you seven steps to a happier marriage. No, he just, instead he just gives her the normal farewell that she might have expected, but he does it very specifically in response to her honesty about her, her struggle with God, her feeling of being absent from the Lord. He says in verse 17, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. In other words, Eli looks her in the eye and he tells her, God has heard you. And as a fellow believer, I'm going to join in praying that you get what you prayed for. See, Eli knew in that moment when Hannah needed most was not an interrogation or a theology lesson. He didn't need to make sure that everything was right before he prayed. She needed assurance. She needed fellowship. She needed to know that God was there. She needed uh, someone who knew himself in his own experience, how big and large God's heart is and how able it is to take us in, in our brokenness and in our, our needfulness. He, she needed someone who wasn't afraid of her emotions to draw near and be, even for a moment, her friend in the faith, to be someone who supports her, and loves her, who cares about her. She needed someone whose heart had been widened through God's grace, experienced in times of heartbreak and unfulfilled longing to step forward and say, the Lord is with you. I will join you in praying with you. See, Eli practices what Jesus calls us to explicitly in Romans. He wept with those who wept. He prayed desperately with those who were praying desperately. 
He embodied the blessings of the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And Eli did that because he had followed Jesus well in times of his own heartbreak. He'd given his heart to God, and then through Jesus, it was returned to him wider, more full of wisdom and compassion, more able to love even the hurting stranger who he just met that morning. And by the way, walking up to somebody when they are weeping so much that their mouth is moving and they're just covered with tears and there's always, you know, a little bit of mucus running out when you're weeping like that, like that's an intimidating thing. It is an intimidating thing. It's not something people just do. Eli did it because he had experienced Jesus in his own heartbreak. And he knew, I can come up to this person without fear because I'm with the Lord. And the Lord can take her in. And I can take her to the Lord, and he can take her, because he's God. He's got big hands. So all that leads us to the very end here, which is how do we cultivate this in ourselves? Uh, other sermons are coming where we're going to explore this uh, more in depth, uh, much more in depth. I'm going to leave us just very briefly with two things that we can do to begin cultivating this in ourselves. And the first thing is, as God's people, we need to be aware or start trying to become aware of the scripts or the instructions that we have learned over the years that tell us when we're hurt, we need to protect ourselves. We need to armor ourselves. We need to lash out or we need to avoid whatever, whatever it is. Uh, we need to be aware of this so that when we pray to God about our hurts, about our heartache, about our longings, we can specifically ask him to help us not respond that way. Lord, I am feeling unfulfilled, unloved, uh, mistreated. I don't have the life I want. And I know that the way I've learned to respond to this is to move, change circumstances, get angry, manipulate, avoid, self-medicate. I don't want to do that, Jesus. That's not what I want. I want to experience your redemptive power in this. I want to experience your presence. Father, don't let me respond that way. Help me instead to know your presence in the middle of this difficulty. That's one thing. Uh, it's prayer. Prayer for the Lord to help us be merciful and kind, to help us to forgive, to help us to trust that he makes all things beautiful in their time, like the preacher says in Ecclesiastes, and so that we can Wait and be generous and trust in him. Prayer, reflective prayer is one. The, the other thing, the second thing, is something that we need to do together as a church, which is assure each other that Jesus hears us and then pray for each other. So it's prayer and prayer with assurance in the middle. That can be hard. It can be hard. Getting close to somebody who's weeping, someone who's distressed, someone who's angry or who's determined to avoid things at all costs, that is hard. It is scary. It's intimidating. We feel completely inadequate, and we are. And yet, as the church, our job is to represent Jesus, who draws near to the brokenhearted and the sinner and the fearful. And can I just tell you from Eli's response, there's so much spiritual wisdom in this. When you draw near to someone in the church who is experiencing this, you do not have to come with answers. You can simply come with prayer. You do not have to come with solutions. You can simply come in the name of Jesus and say, I don't know, but Jesus does. Let's just pray about it and I'll just be with you. That itself is all Eli did and that brought renewed joy to Hannah's brokenness. You don't need to have the answers because you have with you the one who does, Jesus. All you need to do is bring them into his presence with the assur and assure them that he's, he understands, he hears, he listens, he's there, he's working. Jesus is there. That's our calling as a congregation. That's it. That's the, that's the floor. And it's when we do that in Jesus' name, and again, as we do this through prayer, that that is how we live out the prophetic witness that Jesus has given us. That's 
one of the major ways. That's how we help people experience the culture of heaven and see the shining love of Christ, which does not recoil at difficult emotions. It doesn't distance through anger. It doesn't avoid problems. It draws near and says, I know this is hard, but Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He will heal and fix and save. And as that happens, families as broken as Elkanah's, people as hurt as Hannah and Penina, they find help and they find healing and they experience the power of the gospel in their lives. And that's what we want. We want all of us and all our visitors to experience the redemptive work of Jesus. And so let's pray about our response. Let's pray for each other. Let's Draw near in the confidence that Jesus goes with us to carry the hurt and heartache that we have and that others have and to turn it into something beautiful, which are hearts that can actually love the hurting openly. Amen? Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, as you lead us through times of difficulty and heartbreak and unfulfilled longings, uh, we pray that you would expose uh, sinful, unbelieving, destructive scripts that are in our lives, and we pray that you would do this so that we can choose your ways and uh, find and experience life. Uh, Father, we want our hearts to be strengthened by your grace so that the transforming work of your kingdom would be evident in our lives. And So we also pray that you would give us the wisdom and strength necessary to draw near to each other when we are struggling and to encourage each other that you hear our prayers, that you are near, that you love us, so that together we would grow more and more into a community whose a life together amazes the world so that we would be blessed to tell them about how it's all due to the work of Jesus and to the amazing blessing of being his disciples. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.